Oh, do I? Yes, I want him to have one too. There you go. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for coming on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. Um, I just want to say a couple things. Uh, I guess the first is, unfortunately, my co-director, Natalia Beckage, could not be here, but I have some collaborators who are in the audience. Um, Rob Christensen, who's the composer of the film, as well as uh, Sherry, who uh, voiced some of the uh, articles written by Pauline Kale. So it's actually really awesome to be here in New York because, as you know, you know, New York was Pauline Kale's second home, but her first home was Berkeley, which you're going to learn about just a moment. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not going to do a Q&A after because I think you're going to be totally blown oh, away by no. Stu's film. No, no, it's totally fine. You're going to be totally blown away by this film. <laughs> However, I'm going, to be t I'm going to be around after and I think we're going to repair back to the Stonewall Inn. In. So everybody, drinks are on Stu. So <laughs> all right, he's going to open the tab. Thank you very much and enjoy the show. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. We're meeting at the Stonewall Inn afterwards to celebrate, so please come on down. But uh, I made this film because I looked at some of this old, these old home movies and the feeling I had of pride as a, I identify as a gay man uh, was just incredible. And uh, this, us being here today would not have been possible without Cheryl Verjanek, our consulting producer, Kathy Renna with Target Q for making sure we all knew about it. And I really have to thank our marquee sponsor, Sage Services and Advocacy for GLBT Elders. And I would like to introduce you to the Chief uh, Engagement Officer, Susan Herr, just to say a few quick words. But I've seen Real Closet, and um, what I think is that he's actually inviting us to heal. And he's doing that by saying that um, we might sometimes forget our LGBT elders. And in fact, his first film in 2010 tells us that they're going back into the closet in this time of such great pride, if you're in a nursing home and you're waiting for somebody to bring you a towel after you had a shower and they don't approve of your sexuality, you can't afford for them to know that, that you're gay, so you go back in the closet. And we, we are beginning to know that our young people are our family, and we're telling them it gets better, but we've got to remember that we really need these elders. And Stu, this is the second film where he's reminding us of that. And what you'll see in this film is that um, these people are our people. And they're older now, but they're our people and we need them. So I just want to thank you for that. I'd love to welcome Stu back up to the stage. So get your questions ready. Um, you touched on it in your intro very briefly. Can you just talk about exactly why it was so important for you to make this film? Well, I, I like making movies about LGBT older people and history because I've always wanted to have a greater connection to my mentors. I, I don't think we see them as much as we do our straight grandparents. And uh, the first time I saw, you know, some of these images, um, I felt a pride that I had never felt before because I saw them happy for the first time in my life. Now, at my age, that's great, but if we could have younger people, people starting out seeing these images, I think it would be even more powerful, so that's why I made it. Um, any questions right off the bat? What happened, um, Bill, with the, with the focus of this at the beginning of the end, what happened to all of his material? Uh, we are making a movie about it next. He's our next project. Yeah, okay. Because here's the, here's, it was a little tangential to, to include this in the, in the film, but he is actually the first single man in America to adopt a child through a county adoption agency. He was on the Mike Douglas show, and he was on, you know, on the Donahue show, and all this other stuff. So, and incidentally, he did it while running a gay bathhouse. <laughs> so I think there's a nice little film in there. <laughs> so I've got the stuff. That box is not, but I think the point is made that we, you know, he's my landlord. So you just scratch the surface right now, and there is LGBTQ history waiting to be saved that will be lost in the next five to ten years, and it's incumbent upon all of us in this room to reach out to the people we know who are part of that history and say your story is important and your stuff is important and let's 
let's do like what we saw the woman do. Let's record their stories and save them. So actually, we're also looking for more material for this film. We call it a crowd work in progress, where we, if you have material, especially from underrepresented groups of people that you didn't see as much of, that you let me know about it, that we try to save it locally with archives, but we also layer it into future updates to this film, because it's so important for all of us to be able to see each other, not just the, the, the middle class white men with, with the cameras from the 1940s, you know. So. Other questions? Yes, it, it seems like there's little pockets of people doing this all over, a little, a little bit in Washington, a little bit in San Francisco. But is it like your film, is this the first effort to bring everyone together to do that? Through, uh, it's the first time that it's been solely about home movies and things that people have kept of themselves in their closet. My definition was rather broad, but I think otherwise we wouldn't have been able to put in the Edge Lake uh, Resort video at the end, which is you know, primarily important. Uh, <laughs> no, but to answer your question, there is no, there's, there are murmurings of a national historical movement, and if anybody knows about more, please speak up. But this is really happening locally around the country and regionally, and I, I think it should stay local. It's, it's as much New York history as it is LGBT history. I love the uh, lesbian bar footage in the beginning. That seemed very singular to me. And I was just wondering, are there any other kinds of events or scenarios like that that you, you get the sense that the historians are really looking for, things that we don't have yet or things that would be so great to discover? The everyday life, like not, not the parade footage, which is, which is very important, just like he said. But it's the, it's the stuff of people just cooking Thanksgiving dinner, a group of men or a group of women doing that, or or just uh, taking kids to school. Uh, the stuff where we see ourselves doing the, the normal everyday activities, I think is what we're looking for, and what, what archivists are looking for as much as anything. Yeah. Uh, yes, in the front. Um, well, were there, was there any uh, issues finding uh, sources, or, sources uh, or reaching out to people from the film and TV footage uh, at the personal archives? Uh, we have a license to show this film festival-wise. If we were to rebroadcast it, that's going to be another Kickstarter campaign. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, but um, And it's interesting, there is a little bit of a legal... Uh, our attorney's interpretation is that it was going to get thrown out anyway, so it's not theirs anymore. I'm not sure their attorneys would agree with that. And so that's kind of where an area we need to button up if we go forward with this film. But I mean, I think the worst case scenario would be having to take out the guys kissing in the background of that live shot. So. <laughs> <laughs> but they did it on camera in front of everyone, so. Oh, it's not them I'm worried about. It's her, the reporter. I mean, I don't, I don't know if she's, she's cool with that. <laughs> For film festival use, though, we're clear. <laughs> yes? Um, my hometown is in a rural That's my dream, is to be able to, well, we take this film on the road right now so that we can show it and get people thinking, what's, what do they have? But my dream is to find that mixed race couple in the South in the 60s, you know, a lesbian couple raising kids, something, you know, I mean, that's the really great stuff. It is out there. What we have in this film is great and lovely, but it is really the low hanging, the low hanging fruit, I think. It's the stuff that you... The stuff I want to get to is down here, and that's why we're going to continue to update this film. If you know of any of rural areas, I think. You know, uh, interesting, there was a shot about the El Dorado, uh, El Dorado gave farmers. It was one of the first shots. The guys were holding the signs. Apparently, they're still there, and they're in California, and they're having issues, they're, they're a group, having issues surviving, particularly with the water shortage right now, and who's going to take over the farms after that? So. This is a documentary festival. If you are a documentary filmmaker, I give that to you. I think <laughs> someone should ideas. do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I can imagine that you had access to so much footage. How did you decide what to include in the film? Uh, it had to speak to me, and or it had to. I thought it would speak to other people as well. So if I felt like a connection to it, then it was it passed the first test. Yeah. Great. Um, just in the back there with the scarf. Oh. 
Um, I was just curious about the, the skinny dipping video and has, if that led to more insights into the movie industry. Because it seemed like it was like an LA connected film. Did that reveal like more people who appeared? I know there was a whole gay scene in the, in the movie business. That might be how that was developed. I was just curious. Yeah, so San Fernando at that time was really rural. But it, now it's basically almost a suburb of, of Los Angeles. I kind of made a conscious decision in this film to show everyday folks. Because there is, all, there is the Rock Hudson pool party stuff mm -hmm. and all that, and that's wonderful. But I think it's important for everyday folks to see themselves. And uh, I will tell you an interesting thing about that footage is how did they get that developed, right? What I've learned from people from that time was that, well, first of all, in case you didn't know the procedure, you would send off this film for developing, usually in Rochester, New York, or someplace. You wouldn't send it to the drugstore. It would have to go through the US mail. And there would be inspectors there at the other end who would check for decency of the film and moral standards. And that was something that I'm sure they had codes for, but I'm sure was also uh, sub subjective. But LGBT people knew that the inspectors didn't have time to look at the whole reel all the way through. So they would do heteronormative straight stuff at the beginning of <laughs> their reel. And all the stuff that you probably see of the skinny dipping was probably in the middle when they were off like in another room and then, you know, as it was being processed. Now if Hal O'Neill did that where he would take reels you know, back and forth like that in order to create this skinny dipping thing, that's not one reel film, that's a whole weekend of, you know, he was just shooting away. I think that that makes him even more of a hero really. I, it was really wonderful. I appreciated that you kind of poked at issues of class and race in terms of who is documenting and why they're able to and then who's reflected in the history. And it was just so moving to see that young South Asian scene at the end that, you know, in some ways he's colorblind but this is his history, but there was very powerful moments that touched on that because it's something that I don't feel like is always addressed mm -hmm. um, in in queer film Hollywood or a documentary, like the Stonewall movie that the really whitewashed like the kids who did throw the first rock. So I'm just interested, you know, that decision by you to include that when you had all this footage of mostly white people. It's a really, I'm so glad you asked this question because it's kind of the, um, it's like the cross to bear on this project. You know, I don't know what other producers do, but I as a producer know that the way to make a film that people relate to is for them to see themselves. All of us need to see ourselves. So I make a conscious decision to make sure that people of different classes and groups usually see themselves as much as possible, or unless I'm doing some other, there's some reason to not do that. It, they, they get to see themselves regularly in, in, a, in a film. What happened was I was starting to edit in all these different shots in this film to the point where it was becoming unauthentic. I mean, there was just, it was all white men. And I was trying to find, oh wait, there's uh, an Asian woman who, who's like in her mid 40s, let's put her in. And I was doing that so much and <coughs> cherry picking that uh, I realized that this isn't the story. I'm, I'm not being true to the story, I need to address it. And then go out and try to find it. So that, you know, that's what's going on there. It's my mission. <laughs> Help me. Yes. Um, as Tim Kern, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, <laughs> um, as stuff came in, I'm sure it came in not at all in the order we see it in the film. Um, how did you, I can only imagine that you structured and restructured and were constantly reorganizing the thing based on the the sequence in which things actually came to you, that it must have been a kind of a constantly moving target. Well, so, you know, I'm pretty, uh, not real smart with structuring, so it, it usually falls into a chronological thing, which you see here, but I, I want to use, I want schools to use this film and it's kind of more, uh, I suppose we'll take out the orgy lines and things like that. We'll probably have to clean it up. But I want students to be able to see this film in schools, and so I want it to, there to be history lessons and a chronology um, to it, and that's kind of what we hung, hung things on. And it was a real struggle at times to pull back. Even now you can see it that we're, we're still struggling with too much of a history lesson versus what's going on with these movies and things like that. 
I also think there's one, a few too many characters in here. I think that, that, that we need to kind of maybe focus more on the man and the, the woman interviewing the man a little bit, maybe flesh that out a little bit, yeah. just have more space for more movies. So. We have time for one more question. Yes? Well, it was great to see you a second time. So, oh, thank um, you. One I thought you were leaving. <laughs> no, I, I couldn't leave. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> right. but one of the things, I mean, there's, there's in talking to people who are into gay history, I think there's a lot of frustration that on, in academia on college campuses there's a lot of queer theory programs and they're usually subsumed within women and gender studies departments and there's almost no emphasis in academia on LGBT history. What's your sense of, of that in terms of how you, what you've experienced in traveling with the film? I think that there is this enormous disconnect that there is between generations generally. But we have, if, if the LGBT community has a, a huge one. And we are, it's not that you hear about older people saying, I, I feel disrespected by younger people. Well, I don't even know where that would even happen. There is no opportunity for younger people to, to connect in an oral history fashion with, with older people. Sure, there are programs at, at Pride Centers and Sure, there are class assignments, but I'm not. Ta I'm talking about like on a regular basis where this history of history of the LGBT community gets transferred and passed on. It is one of the greatest chapters of American history. We are getting ready to lose it in the next five to ten years, and I I, I applaud queer studies and and everything, but I think we have the we have the chance that we may make the mistake of reinventing the wheel if we don't get some of this great stuff that has been handed to us and and then get ready to pass it on. Well, what that your question? Of, like these institutions financially in terms of doing these preservation? I mean, are, are these? They're on a shoestring, a lot of them. And in fact, that's why you see a lot of these home movies in those bankers' boxes. Uh, God bless the GLBT Historical Society, but they don't have the money to like store those films in the way they should be stored. Uh, they're, collect they're with the papers. And I think there was an archivist last week who said, you know, the papers are easy. Like, we can do those, we can process those. It's these films that we don't have the, how am I gonna play that? So they just get put in a box. We were the first to look at those and get them transferred, so. So thank you so uh, much for making this film. <laughs> so, so